Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. I am Beth Erickson. Our topic today is Pennsylvania's diverse weather and with us is Jeff Jumper, Resiliency Program Manager within the Bureau of Recovery at the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, also known as Pima. Hello, Jeff, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here today. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you what your experience is working at Pima. Yeah, so I recently moved into this role to help plan for resiliency, which has a lot to do with um, disaster um, recovery. And we're trying to look for better ways for um, Pennsylvanians and um, also counties, other municipalities and state agencies to find ways to bounce back a little better from disasters. You know, if we can put up a, if we know they're happening and we can put up a little bit of a better fight uh, against them and, and get back on our feet a lot quicker, uh, we'll all be in a better situation. Uh, prior to that, I spent seven years as the Commonwealth State Meteorologist. Um, I did that role. It was a brand new position that I took on and, and did a lot of um, activities to, to help um, support state agencies during uh, weather related emergencies and, and working with uh, other other individuals and other groups to kind of get better with that and, and spent about 10 years as a broadcaster as a um, broadcast meteorologist prior to that. So I uh, really have a, a, a long background in, uh, in weather and, uh, you know, kind of mixing that in with my, my time as a volunteer firefighter. So um, kind of putting everything together in, in one spot here. <laughs> That's a great way to sum it up. You've got a lot of different skills that work towards this new position you're in. But given your past job as a state meteorologist, mm -hmm. did some folks hold you responsible on days when the weather wasn't quite what they expected? Oh, never. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, I, I often said, you know, I'll take credit for the nice days, but the, the rough days are a little tough. But yeah, you know what? I think, um, I think it's always a conversation starter, right? Um, you know, providing support for the other state agencies. We, we bust on each other, you know, a, a lot of times with it. But, but nonetheless, you know, there's that, that piece of, you know, why people have, you know, maybe their favorite meteorologist on TV or something like that. It's all about trust. And I think that's a, a key part of, you know, having someone on board uh, in the building um, to help support and assist, uh, to sit in the room when decisions are being made to maybe raise your hand and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, the forecast may not support that. So um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it's all fun and it's all part of the job, um, yeah. but, but you know, uh, the inexact science of meteorology, it, it makes for, uh, you know, some long days sometimes. <laughs> so Jeff, when you are ready, you can begin. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the different weather that we have in Pennsylvania. Uh, as we uh, go through the next so oh, I'd say about half hour or so, we'll walk through a couple of different things here. Uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about, so I kind of condense it down into some of the things that that um, you may find more interesting about uh, weather in Pennsylvania. The first thing we'll do is uh, hit on some baselines for the state. You know, what is the average uh, kind of year look like in Pennsylvania when it comes to temperatures and precipitation? We'll highlight some of the weather hazards that are throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, much of what we do at Pima is help prepare people for uh, weather dis or all disasters, but weather uh, tends to be the one that, that we see rather frequently. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about projections with climate change. What does that really mean? Um, you know, we, we have to deal with the impacts of that. So we'll talk a little bit about where things are going. And then we'll talk about a few tips and resources speckled in throughout the presentation. Um, can't be part of a, a preparedness organization without doing that. So um, we'll get right to it. So just giving you a couple of uh, maps here and some information on, on the Commonwealth. Uh, looking at our annual precipitation, you can kind of see where the wet spots are. They're in the darker greens or on the eastern side of the Commonwealth. Uh, what we do is every time uh, there's a, a census done in the US, that's kind of when we do a census of our weather data. So we take the latest 30 years of data every 10 years. So here's your averages from 1991 through 2020. And uh, that kind of gives us a, an idea or, or a baseline when we say things are above average or below average when it comes to precipitation or temperatures. You'll note the, the highest amounts, uh, again, uh, more likely coincide with mountains. We push uh, air up the mountains and it allows it to squeeze out uh, more precipitation from the clouds. And you can see in the southwest part of the state on the Allegheny front there, and also in the eastern part of the Pocono Mountains is where we tend to see our highest amounts of precipitation with our drier areas across the northern tier and then on the east side of some of the mountains uh, where some of that precipitation typically dries up. But uh, you know, some locations, uh, Philadelphia is about 44 inches a year, Erie's about uh, 43 inches per year. And then you look off to the north, you know, Wilkes-Barre is at about 38, State College is at 41. So it's not a huge difference. We average in that 40 to 50 inch range per year across the Commonwealth when it comes to precipitation. How about snowfall? Um, probably no surprise that Erie's uh, in the Erie County area is uh, some of the, the big winners typically from lake effect snow, but your average snowfall there and average year would be 104 inches. 
That's not our peak though. If we go down to uh, Laurel Summit near uh, Mount Davis uh, in Somerset County, you can see we're at 142 inches. Lesser amounts for places like Lancaster and Philly, we're at about 23 and you head up to the Northeast part of the state, uh, about 45 inches. So again, uh, we're anywhere from about 23 inches in Philadelphia to uh, you know about six times as much of that in uh, Mount Davis at uh, 142 inches. All right, let's take a, a point look here. I just picked the middle part in the state and we'll go with Williamsport for this uh, highlight. Annual rainfall, 43 and a half inches. When we break that down, when do we get most of our rainfall? You look here in the summer months, we have more moisture available for it then. You kind of expect that June, uh, July, August, September, we kind of have our wetter months. It's actually pretty dry in February on average, you'll note there. Annual snowfall, about 35 and a half inches, uh, but you'll note typically January into February are our snowiest months, makes sense. Uh, we get the moisture coming in and it's also typically the coldest time of the year, but you get an idea as to when, when this precipitation typically comes here. Uh, as far as Williamsport, your averages, these lines, the top line is your average high, so the daily high temperatures uh, throughout the year, again, peaking in July, uh, hitting its uh, valley in January, and your average low temperature, 41.4, but if you had an average annual, that's the high and the low average together. Uh, for a given year, uh, the climate is about 51.3 for your uh, seasonal averages in Williamsport, and you can see uh, variations of this throughout the Commonwealth, but we just picked out one to kind of give you a, a flavor as to how this looks uh, graphically. So let's get right into it. One of our, our, when we look at our hazard profile, what we do at uh, Pima, uh, we do a hazard profile every year and uh, we take input from, from counties and other emergency managers. And we put this uh, hazard profile together and submit it to the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And, and year after year, our top hazard tends to be flooding. It impacts a good chunk of Pennsylvania's communities. So it's a good topic to discuss today as we walk through some of these slides. Let's take a look at some of the different types of flooding. Uh, when we think of flooding, you close your eyes, you probably think of, you know, maybe that river rising, you know, some of the things back to um, Agnes, uh, Lee, Irene, um, you know, some of those events, you close your eyes and you, you know the pictures, the aerial pictures of towns being flooded. That's the typical one that, you know, we look at. It's an overflow of water onto normally dry land, and it's a longer term event. So it can last days or weeks, and usually that means we have a little bit of time to plan for it, even if it's just a few hours. Uh, but many times we have a couple of days to plan for that. And uh, we know where it's going to flood a lot of times because we know where the rivers are, we know where the streams and creeks are, and we, we have floodplains and other things that we can kind of identify uh, where some of those hazards are. But one of our bigger challenges that, that is harder to predict is flash flooding. A flood that's caused by a heavy or excessive rainfall in a short period of time, typically uh, within six hours of the cause of the event. And that means basically if it rains really hard within six hours, the area floods. Um, so. When we look at these two, there are two different animals that we have to try to attack. And while um, not everyone in Pennsylvania has to deal with river flooding or stream or creek flooding, um, everyone in Pennsylvania has the potential to deal with flash flooding. And we'll talk about a couple of examples where that became a problem. Just a couple of pictures to give you an idea if those of you have traveled on 322 uh, heading towards State College from the Harrisburg area, this, this uh, bridge um, and uh, uh, area looks familiar right along the Susquehanna River there. You can see some heavy rain falling there, folks doing water rescues. This is pictures from uh, 2011 during uh, Lee. And uh, as we look at some of the river flooding here, notice uh, this map here on the left. What this is is a chart that shows uh, the river level. And as the river level uh, slowly ticks up, it moves into these categories. You can see orange, red, and purple. This is Swatera Creek during Lee uh, near Hershey. And each of these blocks here, you can really see them in the red. When you look at those blocks, that represents a six hour period of time going from left to right. So again, as we look here, we can see several hours. It took about 12 to 15 hours to go from this minor flood stage, which typically doesn't impact properties or homes. Once we hit the moderate stage that you know, each river or each creek has, has a level uh, that's considered moderate you know, based off of uh, previous floods. Once we get to that moderate stage, that's when we start to see flooding, but you'll notice it took about 12 to 15 hours when you count these blocks up to even get there. And then eventually this creek continued to go up over its record at the time, which was 16.1, cresting in, in the 20, mid 20s here, and taking quite a while to go back down. You're taking at least a, a day or two before the waters recede there. So a lot of different factors there. Same thing happened uh, with a slow rise in Wilkesbury during Lee. It took uh, you know, another six to 12 hours to go from the, the minor flood stage into the, um, the moderate stage. And then this, this area is protected by a levee. You know, so there's other, other factors involved, but it took a while to get up there. 
So what leads to maybe rapid rises that we're seeing? Take a look at this one. This is the brandy wine during Ida uh, as we go back uh, a year or so ago. And notice what happens there, those blocks, you can actually see the individual dots. What looked like a line when we were looking at the Susquehanna River here uh, is actually a bunch of little dots. And when you see the brandy wine during Ida in Southeast Pennsylvania, you'll note, look at how fast these dots are jumping up here. And it took only one to two hours to go from well below flooding um, all the way up to uh, record stages here. And uh, equally, it went down rather quickly. So the damage happened fast. There's a, there's a benefit to it going down fast like that. But here are some of the factors leading to rapid rises, as you saw on your screen. We have short duration heavy rain events. Those have, been come a, have become a little more common across the Commonwealth, and I'll show you some information on that. Um, more impervious surfaces, what are those? Basically, more parking lots, uh, more developments. Um, you know, uh, many communities following the codes they have to, putting in the retention basins, et cetera. But the more uh, pavement we put up, the quicker that water runs off um, in those areas. Even if there's a, a retention basin or, or something to hold that water off a bit, um, that water is moving faster too and any land use development. So all the things that we do uh, to our properties, as well as, you know, storm systems and storm drains that, that many of you probably have heard, you know, development and updates to those. Some of those things have been around for over a century, right? And we're, we're updating land, we're moving water faster. And that's the result. You see this curve get a lot sharper and we have more significant events that way. Uh, our typical challenges when it comes to you know, longer duration river flooding, uh, tropical storms, snow melt, uh, those are our big ones that, that typically you, know, you have a year where the snow melts. You, know, you think 1996 when the snow melted really fast in almost a day, causing flooding along the Susquehanna Basin, tropical storms you know, you know, into the Allegheny, into the, the eastern part of the Commonwealth against Susquehanna Basin, uh, Ohio River Basin. You know, those are the ones that typically give us our long duration floods. Haven't had a lot of those and I will knock on wood for that because I don't uh, uh, cause any problems there. But if you look at the bottom two, heavy rain and dam failure, and then you combine it with increased urbanization, uh, farming practices, deforestation, we're getting water to move quicker. So there's a lot of different factors. And as of late, we've been seeing a lot of the heavy rain uh, events uh, causing issues. As a matter of fact, there's been research on that. Uh, heavy rain events are increasing. This comes out of the Northeast Regional Climate Center in Cornell. And what they did was they broke down uh, the country into different uh, climate sectors. And they looked between 1958 and 2010 and defined a heavy rain event as two inches in a two day period or a 48 hour period. And they counted those, they did a count. And, and put it against the baseline. And the Northeast United States leads the country with a 74% increase in those heavy rain event days uh, over the past five decades uh, for this study that was here. Uh, and it's, uh, you, you can read some of the other parts of that slide here, but um, the bottom point is, you know, we consider, and, and as part of our resiliency in, in the Commonwealth is having people think and look at flood insurance. Um, and I'm gonna show you some maps here as to why. But flood insurance is something that, that many folks believe you can only get if you live in the floodplain. Your homeowner's insurance and renter's insurance, typically the vast majority of policies don't uh, cover flooding. So if you have flooding in your home, you're kind of on your own unless it's a big enough disaster that, that there's state or federal support uh, in the future. And even then you're probably not getting the full amount. So not only are you paying a mortgage on your home, but now you're paying to repair it or replace it uh, and have all those debts and obligations. So look into it. I mean, personally, uh, I looked into it. I, my home probably will not flood, um, but you know, seeing what happened in, in 2018, as I'll allude to here, uh, and knowing the, the challenges and problems that, that can come up from that and, and how little help there is uh, off the bat, um, I went and bought flood insurance. And secondly, I'm a meteorologist. I didn't want to hear the end of it. Uh, I get busted enough that if my house did flood, why didn't I have flood insurance? But it's, it's really important. Just look at it. Um, it it's, it's one way to you know, uh, help support some of the risks that we do have, especially with being the number one hazard in, in the Commonwealth. So here's what I was alluding to, 2018, it was our wettest year in 127 years of records in the Commonwealth. We had about 64 inches of rain. We were 22 inches above average. Remember that first slide I showed you uh, in different spots? When we averaged the Commonwealth together, we were 22 inches above average. The previous record was 2011. The crazy thing about that um, was we didn't really have any organized um, big events, no big snowstorms with, with heavy snow melt that we were gonna have to deal with for flooding. We didn't have a big tropical system come through. We had some tropical moisture in place, but not an organized tropical system as we did multiple ones in 2011. So we did this all with a pattern that just supported wet weather and with heavy rain events. And as you note on the bottom there, four of the five top wettest, top wettest years in Pennsylvania have occurred since 2000. 
So uh, again, it kind of pushes against that, that data that we showed that heavy rain events are increasing. So I work with Kyle Imhoff at, at the um, Penn State Climate Office. He's responsible for state climate, uh, climate office uh, work here. And we went through and we looked at um, about 45 out of the 67 counties that had um, good, reliable weather data with rain events. And we kind of did our own little study, but instead of two inches in two days, we did two inches in one day. And what this shows is 82% of those, those 45 sites showed an increase in number of days with heavy rain events. If you look on the right side of the screen, uh, 26 out of the 45 sites, so showed at least one day to one and a half days statistically. Um, about 14 of those 45 sites said, well, instead of having one day in the 1980s, we went to two days in the 2010s. And then seven of those 45 sites went from one day to three days. So heavy rain event frequency is increasing in four out of five co-op sites in Pennsylvania. And those co-op sites are, are uh, citizen observers that, that dedicate themselves to taking rainfall measurements every day. Uh, that's how we get the county-based data in order to make some of those mapping, uh, mapping um, uh, images. So again, with our top hazard, um, it was our wettest year on record. Here's Shippensburg. Um, we look at this four out of the top 10 wettest months. So if you just take a month, um, and, you know, 12 months in a year, and you go through all the way back, um, you know, back uh, into the, uh, the 90s and, and 80s, and you can kind of see here, uh, rank number two, three, seven, and 10 uh, for wettest months, add all that precipitation up, um, you can see that four of those 10 happen in Shippensburg. And I've done this for other counties and other, other locations, and you know, the trend is still there in, in the vast majority. I think the Northwest part of the state is the only one uh, was showing a bit of a drier trend. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, number two and number three, these all occurred during uh, tropical systems. So, um, but there are some dates where it just rained pretty heavy during, during summer months. What this map is trying to show you, if you can see the reds and greens uh, on the map, these are flood reports. When there's flooding going on in the Commonwealth, um, if someone picks up the phone and calls the 911 center or someone um, reports to the National Weather Service directly, they take an inventory of this and do a lat -lon, uh, latitude longitude plot on a map, all right? So we took those reports to the weather service from 1993 through 2021. We plotted them on a map. They were all black dots. Then we asked the mapping software to say, hey, can you tell us which one of those dots is inside the 100-year floodplain and which one of those dots are out of the 100-year floodplain? And we did it for all the data points. Take a look at this map. 90% of those flood reports were made outside the floodplain. So when report, people are reporting floods to the National Weather Service, the vast majority, nine out of 10 of those people making a phone call are reporting flooding outside of the floodplain. Again, every county here has a, at least a, a red dot in it, if not more. The green dots represent floods inside the floodplain, flood reports inside the floodplain. Again, this is all anecdotal. People calling in saying, hey, I have flooding on this street or, or my property's flooded, et cetera. But it's kind of telling just to, just to see a map like this and understand that you know, our challenges and our hazards aren't always... Uh, just inside that floodplain, and those aren't the only individuals that need to plan for it. Here's a look at uh, one of those heavy rain event periods in 2018. This is July 21st through August 15th, about a three-week period. Again, the same idea with red dots and green dots inside and outside the floodplain, but this was just from several days and several rounds of storms uh, setting for record wet summer across much of central Pennsylvania. You can see where the heaviest rain is, stretching from Williamsport down to Harrisburg in those bright pinks. And even the blues representing over 15 inches of rain, uh, we're talking about, you know, some of these areas get 20, 30 inches of rain, or excuse me, 40 inches of rain in a year. And if we got, oh, I don't know, a third of that in just two to three weeks, you can tell there's going to be problems. A lot of these areas were saturated. We had no ability to, to absorb the water. And you'll notice the vast majority of those red dot, uh, of those dots are red, meaning they happened outside the floodplain. I saw firsthand many homes and many people. Uh, that were damaged and because of the way the system is set up uh, there wasn't a lot of available funding to help folks that didn't have flood insurance uh, in, in the immediate aftermath as time went on there was maybe some additional assistance but um, these are the kind of things that we have to look at uh, on, on the weather side and be able to plan for right uh, and then basically not much going on in the northwest part of the state we just had a system that brought in a lot of moisture there Here's a look at another event that happened in this if you look back here you can see uh, York Lancaster area in that 10 to 15 inch rain, okay? Uh, August 15th is when this map stops. Well, we had a very significant rain event, uh, just a storm that sat over the same spot. Look at some of these reports. Uh, many of these between a three and five hour period, nine, 10 inches of rain. 
the amount you'd expect to get over the entire summer in some spots fell in a matter of three or four hours. We had reports of people's windows being blown out um, as uh, water was flowing down the sides of hillsides, people living on, on mountainsides that had flooding. Um, never thought they would see that. So there are hazards out there. Uh, again, very small area, but big impacts. And you can see these heavy rainfall amounts. All right, we're looking here at uh, July 2021. We go into Bucks County and it's not just rain. Uh, this, this event is showing uh, uh, six to 10 inches of rain falling in the yellow orange region within three to four hours. July 12, 2021, 100 year flash flood. Uh, what does that mean? You have a 1% chance in any given year to get a flood of that level. It doesn't mean you're only gonna get one in a 100 year period. Just a, a weird statistical way of saying you got a 1% chance of flooding. Well, those people uh, had flooding that day. And shortly thereafter, just down the road, um, we had another storm event uh, while people were trying to recover uh, where we had a, an EF3 tornado come through. Um, so, you know, we do get some of these challenges across the Commonwealth and sometimes they're back to back to back. Um, the emergency manager from that county said, I'm not allowed to be there anymore because of, of, of all the events that occurred there. But, but in reality, uh, you know, being able to plan and prepare for this is what, what we do here at, at Pima and support the counties to do that. So a couple of flood safety tips. We're gonna move on to some other hazards uh, so I don't, don't um, get too far behind. Uh, with flooding, you wanna get to higher ground, never drive through floodwaters. Um, nationwide, statistically, half of all the deaths from flooding occur from people driving through floodwaters and most of those happen at night. Uh, Pennsylvania statistics pretty much match that spot on. Um, most of our deaths uh, from flooding do occur in vehicles and a lot of them occur at night. Um, many times you just don't know what you're driving into. Uh, a bridge that looks like it's there may have been washed out or a road may have been washed out and your car's being taken away. So don't drive around flood barriers. There's actually a, a law now that you can be fined for that. Um, don't walk in floodwaters. There's a lot of stuff in there, sewage, um, animals, uh, other junk, debris. Um, stay away from electrical equipment and wires. Plan and prepare before the storm. Uh, know a couple of ways to get where you need to be. Uh, Find different and alternate routes. Many of us, we drive the same way home every day. Try to think of other ways you can get home if you need to. And consider your options for flood insurance. Uh, you know, it's, it doesn't hurt to reach out to your uh, insurance carrier and ask. Uh, there's national programs. There's, there's uh, private programs. Um, there are options out there for you. All right, so we're going to click on next to uh, severe thunderstorms. We'll talk a little bit about severe weather just as uh, a nice, fun little topic here. We do have to deal with that. I think everyone's been through a, a thunderstorm in, in the Commonwealth. A um, couple ingredients you get for it. Uh, I, I like to cook, so I'm, a lot of the stuff you will see in this section uh, has to do with uh, food. Uh, so a uh, couple of ingredients here in order to get that, cold air or warm air, we call that instability. We need cold air over top of our head, warm air at the ground to get those uh, bubbles to go up into the atmosphere and build big clouds. We need moisture to get clouds, that's our fuel. And we need a trigger lift. Triggers for us can be anything from sun shining uh, on the ground and heating things up, um, to a cold front coming through. Um, it can be the mountains, just winds blowing into the mountains. They have nowhere to go but up. Um, so we have all three of those ingredients and we got to have them in the right order, right? You know, if you're trying to make a cake and you put a dozen eggs in and only a cup of flour, you're, you're just going to get gritty eggs, right? So you have to have all these in the right ingredients in the right amount. Here's kind of a look, a side look, if you're kind of uh, looking at your peanut butter and jelly sandwich cut in half. This is the inside of it. You're looking sideways at the clouds. So this is the, the, the start here of a cumulus cloud. You just have air flowing in. Uh, it's condensing out. It's forming a cloud. In order to get a mature thunderstorm, you have to have air going in and air coming out. The air coming out is the rain falling down. It's pulling down some of the air. It works its way to the ground. And dissipating, you'll notice, you know, after a thunderstorm goes through, a lot of times you have those high clouds left over because it's just uh, leftover air coming down from the cloud and things dry out that way. So that's a, just a quick look at that. In order to get severe weather, we need one final ingredient. We call that wind shear in the weather community, and that's basically just spin. Once we get all that, that storm cloud activity together and we start to spin it, that's when we can get severe weather. So here's a look uh, at uh, just how that works. We, we always have, uh, thanks to friction, if you rub your hands together, you get that warm feeling, right? Um, that friction creates uh, kind of a little bit of a swirl in the ground. When you get a thunderstorm to come over that swirling air on the ground and its updraft lifts it up, that creates a bit of a spin in the cloud. The cloud will stretch that out and we get a tornado. Um, our tornadoes in Pennsylvania don't often look as pretty as the picture on the, the side. We have a lot of moisture in the air and a lot of um, other things that help uh, deter us from being able to see tornadoes in Pennsylvania. Uh, here's kind of a, a perfect textbook example. I put this in here. I worked in uh, Montgomery, Alabama on a TV station during this uh, that big tornado outbreak in 2011. 
Uh, this one sits near and dear to my heart um, uh, because of what we went through there, losing about 250 people in, in the state of Alabama that day. Um, as we look at this, this is kind of the radar view. We're looking kind of cutting through the storm, looking top down. We can look at different factors to find where these tornadoes are, right? We can see where the heavy rain is, where the, all those reds are, and I can kind of tell where my tornado and even the debris is. That little dot on the screen there kind of shows where uh, the tornado would be. You have air coming in, you have it wrapping around with the rain on the backside, and that little ball there tells us, it confirms that there's debris in the air. We can see that with our, our radars and kind of help us confirm a tornado with radar. And you know, we have other tools out there. You can look at you know, those cameras and whatnot. Again, uh, across Pennsylvania, do we get those tornadoes? If you've been, been listening along, then, then maybe you know an answer to this question should probably be yes. We showed you a couple of pictures, but uh, the point that I wanna show you here is you know, when do we get them? Where do we get them? Has everyone gotten them? Um, when I grew up, I, I heard that you know, we don't get tornadoes in Pennsylvania because of the mountains and, and you know, okay, cool. Um, then in, uh, you know, when I was growing up, we had a, an F3 tornado come through a town just north of us, uh, Lake Cary, Pennsylvania, that, that claimed the lives of at least uh, one, I believe. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget that day um, and, and how it felt uh, with the atmosphere that day. Um, we do get them. And if we take a look annually, um, we get about a dozen a year across the Commonwealth. Uh, looking here from the 50s through the 70s and in, in early 80s, the numbers look small. It's not that we didn't get as many tornadoes. It's, it's underrepresented because we didn't have weather radars, right? Um, we got weather radars in the 70s and 80s, and we start to be able to see them more. Nowadays, people have cell phones. We're more aware of it. Um, so some of the weaker tornadoes are getting reported that wouldn't be reported back then. So let's look at the 80s onward. Uh, you'll notice uh, our big years. Uh, 1985 comes in fourth place count-wise, but probably was our most devastating year for tornadoes. If anyone remembers uh, those events, uh, we, had a, we had numerous deaths and, and big challenges from that, especially in Western Pennsylvania. Count-wise, 1998, uh, the year that Lake Cary tornado came through in Wyoming County, um, we had our most. We had 61. And then you look back, uh, 2021 and 2019, our second and third most by count. Uh, so we had, we had pretty busy years over the past few. Last year, we were back down to eight. So most happen during the spring and summer. You can see May, June, July, we have all those ingredients coming together. That's why we get them then. But we've had some in every single month. Uh, for a while, we didn't have many in December, January, and February, but of, as of the past 10 years, we've had uh, quite a few uh, for those standards. And you'll notice afternoon and evening, when do those ingredients come together? The heating, the moisture, all that, that comes in the afternoon and evening. So we count those up and we get them mostly in the evening hours and many times when it's hard to see them. Here's a look at one in February. Had a chance to go up to this one uh, in Luzerne County. Uh, this went right over um, the Northeast extension of the Turnpike. Um, there was a barn uh, that you can see. This is from Google Street View, uh, mile marker 110. You can see it right there on the Turnpike before and after. Uh, this is a horse barn. Luckily, the horses were in Florida. Um, they had a better vacation plan th than I did for the winter months. So they were in Florida. Um, no, no injuries, uh, just this damage, and it flattened that, that um, location. And on our radar, again, we talked about little hook echoes and other things. Our radar wasn't able to uh, see that very well, but we were able to look at the spinning and rotation and identify the tornado and it was a, a warm storm for them. Here's a look at another house, um, uh, you know, where you, know, you look at this, this roof taken off. Um, this is all the insulation in the trees. Um, this was up in, I believe, Pittston Township of Luzerne County. And this happened February 25th, 2017. The next day when we went up to look at this with the weather service, um, there was snow on the ground. So again, uh, getting those ingredients in the right place. So here's a look from 1950 to 2015, there was only one recorded tornado in February. 2016, we had two, one was an EF1, one was an EF2. The higher the number on that scale, the stronger they are. 2017, we had two tornadoes, an EF1 and an EF2. And then in 2018, we had one tornado. Uh, 2018 also featured a 16 tornado outbreak in October. Previously, we only had 13 total tornadoes in the month of October altogether, every, every October from 1950 onward. So um, again, we, uh, when we look at some of this stuff, um, it's important to understand, and, and we'll talk about this when we get into the climate change portion about the shifting seasons. Strongest tornado ever in Pennsylvania. We had an EF, or excuse me, an F5 at that time. We, we changed the scale up a little bit, but this is an F5. Someone got their camcorder out, uh, put it on their shoulder and, and taped this video of uh, the Wheatland, Pennsylvania tornado in Mercer County. Um, so yes, we, we've had an F5 in this, this state. It's not a common thing. It's kind of a once in a generational thing and uh, you know, they are possible. The majority of our tornadoes are on the low end of the scale. About 95% of them are EF0, EF1, EF2. It's not a low tornado if it damages your house, right? Um, and causes problems. So uh, we need to prepare for everything, but we have had EF3s, fours, and at least one five in the Commonwealth. Most of those stronger tornadoes are in Western and Northern Pennsylvania. And most of those have gone through uh, our forest lands. 
Uh, and there's still evidence of that. Uh, Kinswood Bridge State Park is a prime example of an area that had strong tornado come through and, and uh, damage uh, the, the train trestle there. All right, as far as uh, tornadoes where you live, every county has had one. The left side of your screen is a count. Um, so we'll take a look at Dauphin, 19 tornadoes there, but Westmoreland kind of wins it. They've had 41. Um, on tours down at five, Carbon's at four. Some of these are just because they're, they're smaller geographical areas. Cameron's had two. Um, but if you look at the strength of the tornado, the maximum strength, and we use these graphics to help us plan for things, right? Um, all, all counties have had at least an EF1 tornado, but notice all the EF4s that have gone through. These were really long track tornadoes that hit multiple counties at the same time on the same day. But everyone's had some pretty strong tornadoes uh, work their way through. Some safety tips for you when it comes to tornadoes. Get to a basement if you don't have that lowest floor or inside stairwell. Stairwell, uh, I try to say put as many walls between you and the tornadoes as possible. You want to wear a helmet. We found, especially after the, the 2011 outbreaks in Alabama, there's a lot of research. Most of the deaths uh, that they found were from head trauma. So um, any, any helmet will do. It's giving yourself a fighting chance for that. Protect your head, um, protect your kids' heads or whatever you need to do. Um, bring a weather radio or radio. Don't stop to get that. But if you have something down in the basement that you keep, you're able to listen to, to things that are going on if, if you're stuck down there. Don't waste any time. Go fast. A lot of times people want to um, confirm when they see a tornado warning. Um, you know, it's called the mama effect. We're going to call mom and say, mom, is this, is this legit? Um, act quickly because uh, the, the average lead time for tornadoes is 13 minutes. That's the average. Um, you know, sometimes we have a minute or two. Um, sometimes it's hard for us to see it on radar in Pennsylvania. So once the warning is issued, go ahead and take cover. If you're outside, do whatever you can to get inside. Uh, if you're stuck, lie flat in a ditch, cover your head, protect your head, and know what to watch in morning and where you live. We'll talk about that in a moment. So watch, prepare. Uh, that basically is like a yellow traffic light. It's uh, issued to a large geographic region by county usually, and conditions are favorable for severe weather. So we have all the ingredients, right? Um, a warning means act. It's issued for a region or county where weather is imminent or already occurring. That means we think the, the, the hazard is there. So we kind of use this traffic light approach, but again, uh, over time, I get my interest in food will help explain this one. So we look at uh, some of the weather uh, challenges we have. They'll issue outlooks days in advance saying, you know what? Um, I think I might want a cupcake. You know, so this is you in the morning thinking, yeah, I want a cupcake. What do I need to have a cupcake? Do I have enough sugar? Do I have enough ingredients in the house? I might have to go out to the store and buy some. So you got to the store and you bought everything and you have everything sitting there, but you haven't mixed it together. You're under a wash. Your conditions are there. You have all the things. You still don't have a cupcake yet though. Then there's two other terms. There's an advisory. Well, we're gonna make mini cupcakes today. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna break my diet if I eat one little mini cupcake, but it, it could be problematic if I eat all five of them, right? Then the next step up is a warning. If I eat that giant cupcake I made from the, uh, the a tin that I ordered online to make one giant cupcake out of the batter, we have a warning, we have an issue, we're gonna get a cupcake, right? Uh, and from left to right, it's how confident we are that it'll happen. By the time we get to warning, we're very confident that, that we're gonna have it. And how serious is it? Uh, the higher up we go on the scale, the more serious it is. So you go from an outlook to a watch, uh, advisory, and then warning. So uh, know the watch and warning terms uh, and know where you live. Uh, you know, know your county, know where you live, know where you work. Um, those warnings are issued. They use landmarks. They use roadway uh, markers. Kind of get a, a sense for where you are based off of that and read those warnings. Uh, because no longer do we issue warnings by county when it comes to severe weather. It's issued by a box that they draw over an area so we're not over warning people for storms. All right, finally, we're going to wrap up here with just a couple of slides on climate change, what lies ahead. So I talked about some of the hazards that are out there, all right? Uh, what our big thing that we look at in Pennsylvania and, and when we talk climate, uh, when we have to plan for this, is shifting changes in extremes. Um, so, for example, here, what we see on this map, the past climate is, is this bell curve, okay? You know, maybe from high school math class or something, you remember the bell curve. We don't get really cold all the time. We don't get really hot all the time. We're kind of in the middle here. But what happens here with the changing climate is we shift that trend. So yeah, we can still get really cold days like we did around um, December, Christmas time this year. Um, but we get fewer circumstances of those. We get fewer times where we're seeing those. Uh, the climate gets a little bit warmer and, and then we get more extreme heat events. So maybe we'll have more heat waves. You know, yeah, we'll have that really cold day. It could be very cold, it could be record cold. We get one of those, but maybe we'll have two, two or three heat waves when we only had one originally. So we see that shift in climate there. If you look here at the U.S. annual temperature compared to the 20th century average, 
I noticed it was kind of cooler in the early uh, 19th uh, or 20th century, I should say. And then as we moved into the 21st century, notice this map showing a difference from the average. It's pretty much warmer everywhere across the country based off of a, a middle uh, baseline standard from 1901 to 2000. Uh, you kind of look at some of these numbers, but you get that idea of the trend. It is, it is warming. The top five warmest years in Pennsylvania, uh, this is going back to the eight, late 1800s, 2016, 2020, 2021, 2012, 1998, all within the past 30 years or so. Top five coolest, all in the 1920s, or excuse me, all in the 19 teens and 1920s for the most part. Uh, 2022 is that, that green line that was showing up on, on the, the map there. So we've been uh, going up. If you look, yeah, there's times where we get cool, but if you look at the whole trend, we've gone up about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit per century, which does have impacts. It's not straight across the board though. So look at this, January minimums, we're getting warmer in the winter months, right? Uh, our overnight lows are getting warmer. We're noticing that right now. Uh, this happens to be kind of a La Nina year. Where it's typical to have a warmer, warmer winter. But if you look here, look at the July maximums in, in the Northeast. They're not getting that much hotter, right? Um, yeah, they are getting a little bit warmer, but where we're noticing the difference is sometimes in the overnight lows. That could play a significant impact when we're talking about cooling down during hot summer days and the ability for people to cool in their homes, especially if they don't have air conditioning. So this is the big, big slide. It's seasons are shifting. We get a little bit more summer. We're shrinking winter. Um, you know, wider variations between events. We could have a heavy flooding year and then six months later have a drought uh, condition. Yeah, on average, it looks like we're getting the same amount of rain, but if it all dumped in three weeks and then we went three or four months without rain, you can have those high ups and downs. And we've noticed that across the country. Here's a look at the precipitation, top five wettest years, all in the 2000s, with the exception of 1996, top five driest. Uh, the closest year to us would be 1963, 1965. So uh, again, our trend here is showing we're getting wetter years and, and we get pictures like this. Uh, Fred from the Weather Service in Pittsburgh had sent me some of these uh, as we worked on presentations together and look at some of these, these floods, right? We're seeing more of this, 2011, 2018, 2022. Uh, all these flash flood events were one in 100 year events having a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. What are our top climate hazards per Climate Central? Green dots all across Pennsylvania. Precipitation, maybe, maybe some warming uh, to, toward Erie County. So yeah, we know that that's gonna be a problem and a challenge that we have to, to go through. Here's an example of impacts as we wrap up here. Uh, severe weather drives a record high number of power outages events Power outage events in Pennsylvania, according to the PUC report, 2021 saw the highest number of reportable outages events that PUC has ever recorded, or PUC has ever recorded. And all those events were caused by weather impacts on the electric distribution system. So we get all those ingredients coming in more often. We get impacts, and we're seeing challenges on an aging infrastructure. It all becomes uh, a, a big issue. Uh, but there's some good news. There's some, some reports out there, um, DCNR, DEP. Uh, and other state agencies have climate impacts assessments, climate change reports, adaptation and mitigation plans. You can leaf through some of these and see what the Commonwealth is doing and see how some of those impact, um, some of those ideas can come down to your level uh, at, the, at the homeowner's level or at the municipal level, some suggestions for moving forward and how to combat some of this stuff, how to become more resilient. Uh, this is my final thought before I go to the last slide. Um, you know, final thought on climate change, you know, a lot of things that, that we hear when we have a, a major event, especially when it's cold and it's, it's opposite of, of what, what many would think is, is warming. Um, is a single event a direct result of climate change? Not really. It's not, not that. We look at trends when we're talking climate. Um, you know, you think, um, you know, your mood for a given day is the weather and your personality is the climate, right? So individual events, extreme events do not constitute climate change, right? Um, we can't say event A is, is exactly attributed to this, right? But the frequency of these types of events and the seasonal shifts are an indicator of a warming climate. So that's kind of that, that uh, personality mood uh, combination there. So uh, again, when we have big events, you know, we look at those, okay, well, we had a big cold event. Well, what was it like last decade? Well, we had five of those. Well, in this decade, maybe we had eight of them. And then the next decade, we, we had 10 of them. Do we have to look at that trend and, and how things are changing? So I'll leave you with that. Um, this is my, my last slide. Um, I actually have one on the end because some people were asking about snow. Where's our snow? So I'll leave you with this. Blizzard in 93 and Blizzard in 96, our last uh, major statewide uh, snowstorms that hit a category five in our uh, the snowstorm uh, uh, um, system here that they, they rank things. So we'll leave the screen up for a minute and I will uh, give this back to Beth for question. <laughs> right. The snow, it's January, what's going on? 
Do you think sure. we're going to see some snow this winter? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I do think we'll see it. Um, you know, there's the, the pattern we're in, and we've been in it for the past two years, is called the La Nina pattern. Um, with La Nina patterns, it's a, a general uh, shift of the jet stream because of uh, cooling and warming in the Pacific Ocean, right? Um, so when the jet stream shifts, it changes. That's basically the, the roller coaster track, right? The roller coaster track is favoring right now warmer weather events. Our, our change in climate favors warmer weather events. An individual storm can easily come up and give us all the snow we need for a winter, right? Um, that's not in the realm of possibility, but the chances of getting all of those ingredients to come together at the same time, like when we talked about severe storms, same thing goes for winter storms. To get the cold air, to get the moisture, to get the storm coming up the coast, um, have that happen all at the same time, your odds are typically reduced during a La Nina year versus uh, you know, a neutral year or an El Nino year to get those types of snowstorms. Well, we have some questions from the audience, so let's okay. get to those. Um, one of them is about flooding. So are there any resources available as a flyer that can be distributed to the public about flood insurance or where is the best place to get answers about flood insurance? Right, so we, um, uh, we have a national floodplain um, uh, a person in our, in our building that coordinates that for the state. But uh, the one last thing I was gonna say at the end was ready.pa.gov. That is uh, Pennsylvania Emergency Management's um, outreach page, right? There's a lot of information there about flooding and, and that should lead you and link you to the information you need about uh, flood insurance. Um, and, and other flood resources, right? Uh, if you're, you're in a floodplain, many of you know, if you live in one uh, and you have a federally backed mortgage, you have to have flood insurance, right? But those are, the only, those are the only ones that have to have it. So there's not a lot of information out there. Also, the Pennsylvania Insurance uh, Commission uh, has a lot of good information in there as well. But um, ready.pa.gov, uh, click through there, get to the flooding information. It's a great spot in order to, to, to find out more information on, on some of the things you can do to fight back for flooding. Thank you. Is there a plan to map urban flooding either in Pennsylvania or across the US? Yes, so there's there's a lot of projects that go on, uh, things that, that we're, we're involved in, things that, that information we get from other folks, but um, you know, a lot of this stuff has been anecdotal over time. Uh, it does rely on people reporting in. You know, we can show that, that 12 inches of rain fell somewhere, but if it fell in an area that's not populated and, and we weren't able to get up there and there's, there's no evidence of it, right? You know, it may have, um, but but you know we have to know know that kind of information. I do believe there's there's some studies ongoing out there. We we've done some some basic research in order to get um, funding for grants to to maybe put in more rain gauges or other things to help us uh, predict when one of those events is, are going to happen. Um, the technology continues to get better in the forecasting realm. That that I do believe we're going to have a better feel for that. Um, I know FEMA has a, a risk mapping tool. It's called the Wrapped tool. I don't remember what that that stands for right now, but uh, if you Google FEMA Wrapped, um, I believe you can click on it, and it talks about the different hazards to that area. Recent reports for for other things. It's a planning tool that, that we can use, but um, you know we've looked in, and, and you know a wish list for Pennsylvania would be able to say, hey, if I'm going to buy a house here, if I want to live here, I can click on that and get a list of all the things that have happened nearby. Right? You know, there was a tornado two miles up the street, or you know this there were there were floods reported here, et cetera. Um, we want all that, that information available as we, we move into the future so people can make better decisions. So if somebody wants to get involved with um, reporting rainfall measurement, how do they do that? Sure, there's a couple different ways you can go about doing that. Um, you can just reach out to the Weather Service. If you go out and, and purchase a rain gauge, um, my recommendation is, you know, go on, hit a search engine and look for, um, you know, uh, best places to put put rain gauges. There's one really good resource and it's it's a weird um, phrase I'll, I'll try to type in the chat here when I'm done done talking but it's called cocoa Raws. it stands for community collaborative rain hail and snow uh, reporting network basically if you go on that website it'll tell you everything you need to know about uh, recording rain and snowfall amounts and it's a community effort so if you get a snowboard and a ruler or um, a rain gauge it'll tell you where to put that there's training uh, modules on there and you don't want it under your gutter or under your, your house you want it you know, far away in an open area um, you can report that directly to the National Weather Service. You can report that through the COCORA site on your cell phone or on, on you know, your, your desktop computer, laptop. Um, you know, we have it set up at Pima. I have it set up at home. I usually just measure snow, um, but it's an easy way to do that. And, and believe it or not, the snow measurements of all things become extremely important. If we have a, a major snowstorm for us to get a federal disaster declaration, um, we have to have record or near record snowfall. So we need solid, uh, good measurements. 
And not every county can provide that to us because it, you know, not everyone makes those measurements. If we don't have those measurements, uh, if people call it in and put it on social media, they won't accept that. We have to have it through like COCORAS or a co-op or through the National Weather Service. So uh, the more people we can get on COCORAS, that, that's considered uh, semi-official measurements, the, the better. And, and they have all different types of information. And they also have a store on there where you can kind of look and see different stuff you want to buy. But you can always go to your hardware store or whatever and pick up whatever rain gauge you want. It's a great way for Pennsylvania residents to get involved. Mm -hmm. So we have some questions. There's several okay. about theories about tornadoes. Um, one theory is that the Susquehanna River provides a boundary or that the Appalachian Mountains do so that we don't get quite as many tornadoes in certain areas. So what's the truth the, uh, about the geography of our state? Yeah, so um, the, the main reason that we don't have as many tornadoes is we don't have all of the ingredients come together as frequently, right? Um, we talked about the, the moisture, we talked about the instability, they don't always come together uh, at the same time. As far as geography, um, for the weaker tornadoes, not only can it impede it a little bit, it could also enhance it uh, at times with, with different airflows. But you have to think our mountains at, at most are a couple hundred feet in some spots to about 3000 feet, right? Um, uh, the storm producing the tornado goes 40, 50, 60,000 feet in the area, higher than planes are flying, right? So the whole storm itself has to be rotating in order to get a tornado. So yes, where the tornado is, is probably in the bottom thousand or 2000 feet from the ground to the bottom of the cloud. But the whole storm is rotating, and that is the, the main character for most of these tornadoes. Uh, and a lot of our tornadoes, too, you know, the other piece is sometimes they come through on these squall lines that go through the state. And it's just as that line goes through, they kind of curve on the end. You get a quick tornado that's, that's a weekend. It, it's, it's spin, the storm is spinning, yes, but not, not a supercell like you'd see in the, you know, in, in the south or in the, in the Great Plains. So, yes, our, our, um, our, our geography plays a bit of a role in it, but it's more that we don't always get the ingredients that we need. They're, they're very abundant often uh, in the deep south and into the, the plains. And, and you know, we've noticed some shifts and trends anecdotally. You know, the southeast part of the state, you know, has, has recently been under the gun, you know, east of the mountains uh, for this because we're getting a lot of moisture pushing in off the Atlantic and even from the Gulf of Mexico. So um, the mountains, yeah, they can play a bit of a role. But but when you're thinking of a storm that's 50, you know, 50,000 feet tall versus our mountains, which are, you know, up to 3000 feet tall, um, you know, it's more of an ingredient thing than it is um, a geographic thing. So another tornado question. This one mm -hmm. seems very specific to somebody's house. Okay. During a tornado, is it better to hide in a tub in the highest part of your house or a stairwell open to the ceiling in the lowest part of your house? Yeah, that's that's a tough question. Uh, certainly the lowest lowest level that you can get, right? Um, you know, it could be a closet. A stairwell might, might not be the best. What, what I try to do is take a look at your house, you know, depending on what it is. You know, everyone has different setups in their house. If you don't have a basement, then you go to the, you know, the lowest level of the house. Um, Put as many walls between you and the tornado as possible. So, for example, if you have a closet in the middle of your room, well, there's probably no windows in that. There, there, you can you can close the door. Uh, you want to protect yourself the best you can. Uh, an open stairwell probably not the greatest, um, but if you can find maybe a closet on that level um, to get yourself into, or or a space that that puts. Okay, now I can count. I got one, two walls in between me and the outside of the house, and I have, uh, you know, the first floor. Or excuse me, the the second floor above me and then I have the roof above me. That's your best bet. Uh, you want to be as low as you can because, um, you know, a lot of the science there, once things break apart, any garage doors coming in or, um, you know, the roof lifting off, that's when you start to see some damage and collapse of the house. If you lose, you lose some of those structural members that are holding it together. And those are your typical failure points. So you want to be as low as you can, um, protect your head and, and try to put as many walls between you and the, the outside as possible. I think your advice too about if you have a helmet available, yep, use the helmet. helmet. So that's a great one. Um, one question about bomb cyclone weather events. Do they? Okay. What are they? And do they happen in Pennsylvania? Yeah. So bomb cyclone. Uh, there, there's like a weather dictionary of like cool things that that has been picked up by the media, like polar vortex, bomb cyclone. Um, bomb cyclone, the bottom line for that is it's uh, all of our storms are, are cyclones, uh, whether they're tropical cyclones, a hurricane, um, or an extra tropical cyclone. All, all extra tropical means is outside the tropical latitudes of, of the earth. So extra tropical cyclones are outside of that. Those are our typical winter storms uh, when we get a cold front, and a warm front coming through, right? 
Um, cyclone, all that means is the pressure is lowering. I believe it's it's 24 um, millibars or the, the pressure measurement we use in 24 hours. And the bottom line, if you hear that phrase being used, it's going to be a bomb cyclone. It just means that the storm is intensifying rapidly, um, which means the effects that go with that. An intensifying storm typically will bring stronger winds, um, you know, the potential for stronger storms embedded in it, whether it's a tropical or, or a, an extratropical cyclone. So we can be impacted by a storm system that is go undergoing bombogenesis or you know a, a rapid intensification. So absolutely, and we have been. Uh, I don't have any off the top top of my head to to name, but but those are storms that that um, that, that do move through and they they typically uh, rapidly intensify. And we have a challenge sometimes modeling the exact impacts because it kind of goes outside the the scale of what we're we're used to doing. So our last question from the audience is: What would your advice be for somebody looking to enter the emergency? emergency preparedness field or meteorolo meteorology side sure. of, of sure. this? So um, emergency preparedness, there's a, a lot of different things you can do. Um, think about what, what, you're, what you like to do, right? Think about your skill sets. If you like to, to help people directly, you want to put your, you know, get out there and help people after disaster. You know, you may want to look at nonprofits like a like an American Red Cross or Salvation Army or something along those lines, um, or, you know, your local church organization that goes out and helps people uh, right there. Um, joining the fire department, EMS, uh, if you want the hands-on, I mean, there's a part of my life I still do it uh, because I like that part of, of, of handling it. If, if you look at emergency management, it's handled at the lowest level. So if there's a disaster in your town, the people responsible for it is your local municipality. They have the ultimate say as to what goes on in your neighborhood, right? Um, then you go up a layer from that and you have the county emergency managers that help with some bigger picture items for, for the region itself. Um, and then you step up the next level at state and then to the next level, it's federal. But uh, everyone takes their cues from, from the local community or, or the county. Um, so there's many places to get involved. If you reach out, find out who your municipal emergency management coordinator is, go to a, a township meeting or a, a, um, a council meeting, see if they need help. The answer is probably yes. Um, we have to have by law a, an emergency manager uh, coordinator for every municipality in the Commonwealth uh, that's appointed, I believe, by the governor. So. Uh, there's ways to get involved in, in, in the government side of things, um, whether you want hands on and, and, and join something um, uh, you know, your community level, or if you want to you know, have a job at the county or state, you're going to be applying on, on websites. Um, I'll give you a little background for me. I, I was a volunteer firefighter since I was 14, as I mentioned, and then um, I went to school, went into meteorology. Um, ended up in TV. It wasn't my original plan. Did that for 10 years, but that uh, tornado outbreak in Alabama really uh, changed my mind. Um, I, I really wanted to get back into to helping people directly. I, I, we did help a lot of people through the TV screen. Um, you save a lot of lives that way. But I, I wanted to get back into it. So I went back to school for emergency management. There's a lot of online classes you can take. There's there's online programs you can take um, you know, to, to work on degrees if you want to go in that direction. Um, but really, it's going to be a combination of, of, of experience as well as, you know, uh, knowledge and, you know, book knowledge, academics. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot out there. I mean, uh, we're, we're hiring people at Pima. Uh, if you go on the, the state website to look for jobs, you can do that. Uh, look with your county, but uh, at the bottom line, you can probably get out there and just, just kind of shadow with someone. Reach out, hey, can I come in and see what this is all about? And they will probably quickly add you on as a volunteer uh, and you can get there and, and, and help your community in disaster. Um, we, it's, we need it everywhere across the Commonwealth. So Jeff, what would you like the audience to remember from today's program about Pennsylvania's diverse weather? Sure. So um, I think it's important to to understand. Um, you know, the one biggest point is, is is know what you need to do in an emergency, right? Um, know where you live. Know exactly where you live. Town names, streets, counties. I mean, many of us know that. Um, know where you work. Know where your family lives. Um, so you, so you can help alert people. And that that comes down to this this last point I want to make. Have a way to get alerts and have a plan to act on them. And not just one way. Have two ways at a minimum. Um, we get a little bit of everything in Pennsylvania. Occasionally, it's on the extreme side of the scale. Um, make sure you have a way to get severe weather alerts. I mean, some people um, sign up for alerts through their local TV station. They have an app. They have everything on their phone. But what happens when your phone's in the other room? What happens when you're sleeping? You know, do you leave it on silent? Um, maybe get a weather radio. I, you know, we try to push weather radios. That's I call it a smoke detector for severe weather, right? Um, when you're sleeping, uh, you know, if your smoke detector goes off, it wakes you up and it alerts you to get out of your house. Have a weather radio. Those will go off again for a limited number of weather emergencies. At least wakes you up so you can look at your phone if you don't want to listen to it. Um, have multiple ways to get that information, right? And then have a plan for that. And that's why I want to push that ready.pa.gov website 
it has so much information on where you can get alerts, um, what to do, what hazards to do. Um, uh, there's, there's PDF documents on there that help you plan things out. Um, just make sure you're ready for it to become a little more resilient against uh, the things that Pennsylvania has to offer. And it's not just weather hazards, it's all, all hazards that we have. It's, it's a really good guide and it's, it really gets your mind in, in a good spot. And the best part about it is you don't have to do it all tomorrow. You know, if you want to make a go kit, you know, slowly build up those supplies and get them together. You don't have to go out and buy, you know, $100 worth of food to stock up. Just every time you go to the grocery store, grab two or three extra cans of something and put it in your kit. Um, you know, it can, can kind of be a, a crawl, you know, crawl, rock, yeah, crawl walk, run uh, type scenario. But again, have a way to get those alerts. If you don't know what's going on, then you're not going to be able to prepare for it. And the longer you wait, the less time you have to act. Thank you, Jeff, so much for being part of this program today. You're I think welcome. all of us can relate to the food references and graphics <laughs> like that giant cupcake. So that was terrific. It was lunchtime. You, you got me at that, that point. I'm ready. <laughs> it is learn at lunchtime. So that's perfect. Thank you to the audience for your questions. If you want to explore more about this topic, you can visit Pima's website or the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website. The links are in the chat box. We hope that the audience will join us again for more Learn at Lunchtime programs. Visit our website for program information and to sign up.